Hello, everybody. Welcome in the event, uh, a workshop called Digital Citizenship and Participatory City Making. Um, my name is Zuzana Revesova, and I'm here for Creative Industry Košice, who is organizing a project called uh, Slovak-Norwegian Cultural Matchmaking, together with our Norwegian partner, Urban Space Lab. Uh, the project is supported by Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway through EEA and Norway Grants, working together for a green, competitive and inclusive Europe. Uh, the scheme is uh, administered by National Contact Point, the Ministry of Investment, Regional Development and Informatization of Slovak Republic. And I'm here to welcome all the beautiful speakers uh, who are joining us from Norway and from Slovakia. Uh, gradually, we will um, hear from Lori Vestel from Urban Space Lab, Michal Hladky from Creative Industry Košice, Malin Kok Hansen from DOGA, uh, Hege Johansen from Lebesby Municipality, Martin Bendixen and Ivan Rajbojentov from Plenum, Viktoria Mravčakova from Spolka, Mišo Hudák from Východné Pobrežie and Pavel Miroshej from Slovensko IT. Um, and now I give the floor to Loli Vestel, uh, the founder of Urban Space Lab, to give us the introduction. The floor is yours, Lori. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, greetings from Telemark, Norway. I want to welcome everyone to our new project called Slovak Norwegian Cultural Matching in cooperation with our new partner, Sika. Thank you so much, Sika, for this. Um, I am sitting here on the islands of southern Norway. Uh, you can see the picture in the background uh, that I made a place, a coastal area called Bredik. And um, I'm wondering and asking myself this question. What do the cultural industries have to offer our changing world? And how are we in our networks, wherever we are sitting across Europe, using digital tools to connect place, identity, and belonging? We are right now holding an international conversation together and we will be using a series of six workshops, one each month, where this is the first one, to examine a wide variety of topics from everything from placemaking, humanitarian architecture, urban landscapes, the arts, and dance. In today's workshop, we've invited experts from Slovakia and Norway to discuss placemaking with their counterparts counterparts. We match visionary people across Europe and share new solutions to the problems facing our communities. Um, I thank Michael I thank Michael Ladke, Director of Creative Industry Kosika, for inviting us into this international collaboration and I give the screen over to him. Thank you so much Michael. Thank you Laurie. Uh, so now I'll ask also Michal for his introductory uh, speech. Yeah, thank you very much, Lori, for your kind words. And we are Creative Industry Košice, a legacy organization of the European Capital of Culture. We have uh, quite a few years of uh, experience in culture-led development and urban development uh, based on using arts and culture as a mean for change. All the topics you mentioned are very relevant for the future development and collaboration uh, throughout Europe. And we are very happy that we, with this project, we start uh, cooperation with the Norwegian partner, Norwegian experts, and we are happy to connect bilateral collaborations also on an expert level or on a level of organizations dealing with different topics, being the placemaking, being architecture, arts, culture development. So as you already, already mentioned, we are looking forward to hold six uh, roundtables or discussions on different topics and hopefully also start collaborations on individual or collective levels uh, between Slovak and Norwegian organizations. So happy to open today's discussion on the topic digital citizenship and participatory city making. City making is also one of our topics and we are very much focusing on well-being. So uh, I would like to hear how digital technologies could also uh, help citizens to feel better in their cities or wherever they are 
remotely working or whatever they're doing in an online world in, the, in their cities. Thank you very much and looking forward to today's discussion. Thank you, Michal. Thank you very much for your introductory words. And um, now I would like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, we'll have Norwegian presentations uh, in the beginning. Um, and our first speaker is Malin Kok Hansen. She is a senior advisor for Design and Architecture Norway, uh, DOGA. Uh, she's a project manager for GNIST program. And uh, she's also uh, working as an advisor uh, in different uh, other projects. Um, she graduated in political communication from Aarhus University in Denmark. So we are very happy to have Malin here, uh, who's a great expert. And um, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much. And thank you for the kind invitation to take part in this very, very interesting uh, uh, webinar uh, workshop. Uh, do you see my presentation okay now? Yes, yes. thank you. Um, great. Uh, well, um, first uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I will be talking about uh, this uh, innovation program for Norwegian municipalities called GNIST or SPARC uh, in English. Uh, <clears throat> let's see now. Yeah. Um, and I am a senior advisor, uh, as uh, already been told in the introduction, uh, for Design and Architecture Norway, or DOGA. Uh, we are a public innovation tool. Uh, we are fully financed by the Ministry of Local Government and the Ministry of Trade. Uh, and our uh, mission is to stimulate innovation, efficiency, and increase value creation through the use of design and architecture in both the private and the public sector and very often also uh, in between uh, these two sectors uh, in, in collaboration, project, uh, collaboration projects. Uh, so uh, just to, to put you into context, uh, Norway, uh, we have 5.4 million inhabitants approximately and 356 municipalities. Uh, in Norway, we have a very strong regional policy. Uh, there's a great political will to, to make it possible to, to live and work and thrive uh, in the whole country, uh, even though we have a very, <laughs> very uh, big, vast country. Um, uh, and this is uh, well, basically a political consensus across uh, uh, parties that, uh, that uh, it, it should be possible to, to stimulate and enhance uh, uh, livable and attractive communities uh, across uh, the whole country. Uh, and uh, this is just uh, the map just uh, is just to showcase uh, the number of applications and the number of uh, municipalities that we are working with this year uh, in the GNIST program. Um, Elebesby, who will present now after me to, to demonstrate where, what has been done in practice. I will just like set the framework. Uh, they were part of the program last year. Uh, but just to, to showcase that, of course, there's more uh, people living in the southern part of Norway, but, uh, but the whole country is uh, basically represented. And uh, well, uh, the GNIST uh, or SPARC program uh, is about, <clears throat> it's a needs driven or challenge driven program where we take uh, real uh, concrete uh, challenges in, uh, in the municipalities and, uh, and turn them into uh, new ways of thinking and new solutions uh, by using design and architecture as, uh, as tools. Uh, because, of course, uh, there are some challenges um, in, in the rural or, or regional district parts of, uh, of Norway, uh, connected to, many of them connected to demo demographics and, uh, uh, and uh, housing, uh, uh, elderly po uh, population, uh, and so on. Uh, but that's... that's the core of the program that we take. I mean, we don't put, we don't demand like uh, what focus the municipality should have. Uh, but the, 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 I mean, the challenge comes from, from the municipalities themselves. Uh, and uh, in the SPARC program, we also uh, 
uh, because I, I mean, of course, we need we need workplaces and uh, business development in the whole country. Uh, but in the recent year, there's been more and more focus on that. Uh, of course, this is uh, this uh, doesn't have to be uh, discussed. But uh, in order to actually be able to to contribute to local communities where people want to live and thrive and uh, and uh, well not only uh, work, we also need to focus on uh, local development, um, place making, and uh, citizen involvement. So these are like the two the cornerstone of the program to to combine these two uh, parts together in order to to enhance the development of attractive local communities across the country. Uh, and I'm not going to go into this in detail because it, then, then I will use up on, on my minutes on that. But uh, uh, this is sort of the, the fundament for the program. Of course, the SDGs uh, is, uh, is crucial in everything we do, but also in um, we have together with approximately 150 stakeholders from public and private sector developed this uh, joint national roadmap for smart and sustainable cities and local communities. And these are sort of, sort of the, the main principles of the roadmap, which we, um, yeah, which we sort of base uh, the innovation program on. So it's a needs-driven program uh, about how to turn real challenges challenges in the municipalities into opportunities, using design and architecture as drivers and tools to showcase the innovation pot potential and to ena uh, enable the municipalities to, to actually initiate, initiate innovation projects that enhance both local and business development. And it's also about showcasing, I mean, how the municipalities can take on a role as uh, drivers and orchestrators of innovation processes in collaboration with local businesses and citizens. How can municipalities go uh, in front and, uh, and uh, facilitate and orchestrate in the process of innovation? Oh, sorry, now I can see the, the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the main uh, uh, subtitle is in, is in Norwegian. But, uh, but the, the tool that we use in this program is called the Design Driven Innovation or Design Thinking. Uh, which is about, well, basically it's a, it's a collective term for creative methods and processes where you create something new or something innovative together. And it's about solving real problems for real users, uh, which uh, means that we can contribute to more accurate and viable solutions. And we believe that the, that the, sort of the potential uh, of design, but also architecture uh, in a different setting than only uh, um, uh, creating uh, buildings, uh, that this is like a really a, um, a way that the designers and, and architects can, can contribute to value creation uh, in communities and municipalities using their uh, citizen uh, focused manner of working, uh, the collaborative manner of working um, to create more accurate and viable solutions, solving challenges in communities and municipalities. So a design-driven innovation process is based on a deep understanding of the user's needs. Uh, it's about uh, <clears throat> enhancing comprehensive solutions through interdisciplinary collaboration. And it's uh, uh, also about continuously improving uh, the solutions through testing and adjusting, adjusting the solution based on user needs. And just to give you a few tips, uh, I mean, how, how to get started with the design-driven innovation process yourself, uh, being part of a municipality or, or working in a municipality or community, um, but also, of course, uh, the business sector. Uh, so number one rule is that you have to be patient in the beginning. Uh, this is an innovation process. It's something else than develop, uh, development or, or an operational process. Uh, and you have to be aware that a design thinking project, a process will require a lot more time in order to make sure that you uh, build um, insight and that you really get, take your time to explore possible ideas and solutions. But the, in this way, by standing in the problem for a long time, you will also most probably get more accurate uh, solutions. 
uh, and uh, and you will also get much more deep insight into the problem that actually you actually want to solve. Uh, and uh, where you when you make a design brief uh, uh, and you call for designers to to take part in solving your challenge, the assignment should be clear but still open. Uh, so, of course, you need a clear ambition, a uh, clear challenge, a clear goal uh, of what you want to get solved. Uh, but in order to really be able to develop new and innovative solutions, you also must be open, uh, open-minded uh, and, and, and also be aware of that. It might be that you don't know the solutions when you start the project. So focus on the challenge, not the solution. Focus on the needs and not the solution. And uh, you also need an interdisciplinary team. This is really important in a design-driven pro innovation process. Um, <clears throat> you need team members that uh, rep represent different um, uh, different disciplinaries uh, and uh, with a different background to make sure that, that you get uh, that your solutions uh, that the possible solutions cover uh, different perspectives. Uh, and also, you have to make sure that everybody is open to change and new ideas, uh, and of course, also include professional professional designers in the team to ensure the quality of the process. And two more, uh, you need to focus on the users, and this is sort of the whole like fundament for success in a design-driven innovation process. And it's maybe easier said than done. Uh, you have to, the project manager has to make sure that the whole team work, thinks and works in a design-driven manner. And, and this uh, person should also have a holistic, forward-looking and integrative mindset and a big heart for the users. And finally, oh, sorry, now this is the wrong, uh, the, again, the wrong, uh, I, I translate, translated it, but obviously I didn't get the the English version for the last one. But basically, uh, you need trust from above. You need trust from the, the leader of the organization or your uh, uh, department in the municipality or in the, in the company. Uh, you need to, uh, um, the, the project needs to be well, uh, well anchored uh, among, the, among the leaders uh, to make sure that you get the trust and the, uh, the confidence uh, that they sort of support the process, and, and this is something that they that they stand behind. Um, and uh, and this is also, of course, maybe even more important in a municipality to, and that's also something perhaps that Lebesby and, and Plan and Design will will uh, discuss that to make sure that you actually get a solution that be might be implemented and, and realized. So yes, thank you. This is I will give give the floor to, uh, or I will let you give the floor to uh, the Lebesby municipality and to Plan and Design that, uh, as I said also in the beginning, have been using this uh, or been part of this process together with us, uh, and and using design and architecture as means and tools to to solve their challenge in their uh, municipality, uh, and they will give you a concrete example of how it might look like uh, in the end. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Malin. Um, thank you very much uh, for your really exciting overview of the tools that you're using in the GNIST program. For those who want to ask questions or clarifications, um, I will now ask Marco to share the screen uh, where you can see the Slido code and the, uh, the QR code, which you can scan and then write the question. So it's hashtag 336. 752 if you want to join at slide.com or you just scan the QR code after every presentation we will show this so that you can uh, actually uh, post questions. And uh, after the presentation of uh, Hege and after the presentation of plenum design we will have we will get to discussion. So thank you Malin and now I will ask uh, Hege Johansson uh, who is coming from Lebesme municipality in Finnmark, northern Norway. Um, Hege has a master's degree in political science uh, and has been working as a consultant uh, for an uh, economic company in Oslo and then moved back to Lebesby to the very far north in Norway and is leading a strategic planning and social and economic uh, development projects. 
So she was uh, the lead for GNIS project where lab has been applied and implemented all the exciting innovations. So now, uh, Hege, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hege Johansson, and I work as a planner at Lebesby Municipality in Northern Norway. And I'm speaking to you now from my hometown of Sjöllefjord, which you can see pictured here, which is also the administration center of Lebesby. So as Marlin has already uh, said, uh, Lebesby was selected to participate in the innovation program GNIST last year. So today I will first introduce you to Lebesby uh, and the demographic challenge that we face, which also served as our inspiration behind our application to GNIST last year. And then I will talk about how we aim to turn these challenges into opportunities uh, and how broad citizen engagement is at the very core of our project. Uh, and then Plinu will talk next about uh, the concept, the modular village. So first of all, let's start by zooming out and placing Lebesby on the map. Um, so here we are on the shores of the Barents Sea, uh, and we are in fact located at the very top of Norway and of Europe. And Lonely Planet once called our region a treasure trove for collectors of northernmost, and among them the northernmost point of mainland Europe. Lebesby is one of the largest municipalities in Norway by area, but we're small in population size with about 1,300 inhabitants. And roughly 75% live in Sjölefjö, which is marked by the Blue Star. And the rest is scattered um, around the coast in villages, here marked by the orange stars. Um, and the long distances within Lebesby are at times very challenging, um, both in terms of uh, providing services to citizens, but also in terms of the mental distance, so to speak, between the different villages and Kjöllefjord. Um, so the distance between Kjöllefjord and the village of Veines approximately equals the distance between uh, Korsitze and Budapest. I had a look on the map. And we also have some challenging Arctic weather conditions, which, uh, which adds to the, to the drama, at least in the winter. And I once heard a quote saying that it's people that make places, not just through numbers, but through their attitudes and actions. And we might be small in terms of numbers, but the people as well as the local businesses and our spectacular natural surroundings make Lebesby a great place to live. Unfortunately, though, we face the same challenge as many other small communities do that of population decline. And this development has gone for several decades. Um, and the effects are, of course, noticeable in many ways. For instance, uh, when it comes to recruitment, which is becoming increasingly difficult, both in the public and the private sector. And there are fewer people left to keep activity levels up in the voluntary sector, which is a sector that plays a key role in creating vibrant and inclusive communities. So in our GNIST project, we wanted to address two main challenges, how to engage citizens in a geographically expansive area, and second, how to counter the effects of population decline. Now, obviously, population decline is a rather depressing development, but we decided to apply a different angle uh, in our experience, many of the people that move away still think of Lebesby as home and continue to take an interest in what is going on here. So we wanted to explore ways of tapping into that patriotism to engage people outside the municipality together with people within uh, Lebesby and as such try to create a sort of population-driven positive force in the future development of Lebesby. 
we wanted to change the narrative that people that move away are a lost resource, but rather can still be a positive force uh, from the outside. And in fact, if you continue this reasoning even further, anyone could be a positive or a potential force for good for Lebesby, regardless of whether they've moved away or whether they've never been here before. And if there's one thing we've learned over the last few years, it's that technology and digital tools open up whole new possibilities for collaboration and participation, regardless of physical presence or distance. So our take on this challenge obviously resonated with the Guinness jury because our application was selected. And over a course of a few months last year, our initial idea was molded and tested and refined until we had narrowed it down to two main issues, which were then introduced in the GNIST innovation competition. So first, we asked for new ideas on the digital collaborative platform uh, with the aim of marketing Lebesby, as well as engaging and connecting people and skills and competence. And some of our initial ideas are listed in this slide. Um, and second, we want to help to explore the concept of digital citizenship and how that could be used to engage people also outside of Lebesby. The photo in this slide is from a digital meeting that we held during the GNIST project. We uh, initially chose to focus on young people in our project and about 30 people gave input on what they considered to be important priorities ahead. And their input was again used when we shaped our terms of reference um, for the innovation competition. And a handful of participants also expressed interest in contributing in a citizen panel in the project. And Plenum, for instance, used this panel actively to gain local insight when they developed their GNIST entry, uh, which was called the mod or which is called the Modular Village, and which ended up winning the innovation competition back in September last year. So I will hand over the screen to Plenum now, but I'll end by saying that since uh, since they won in September, we've applied for uh, funding and we received money from the um, regional authorities to uh, continue uh, working on this concept in a, in a, in a pre-project um, together with Plenum. And so now our uh, goal is to come up with an implementation plan for how we can realize this, uh, this concept. And citizen involvement, uh, both inside and outside Lebesby, will definitely continue to be uh, a fundamental component um, in our project. So thank you. Thank you, Hege. Um, so before we go to uh, the presentation of Plenum, I will ask uh, again Marco to show the uh, Slido QR code. And uh, so that uh, anyone who has questions can uh, see and um, pose them. So are we OK? Just a second, yes. Thank you. So it's a hashtag uh, 336752. And uh, you can also scan the QR code to post questions. It's uh, slido.com. And uh, we will be happy to answer them after the plenum presentation. So now I hope that uh, Martin and Ivan are ready to present. Uh, Martin Bendixson and Ivan Reboyentoft are service designers from the company uh, called Plenum Tienz Design and will uh, showcase uh, the concept that they also succeeded with in the competition for innovation. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Evin Rebiantoft uh, and I'm a service designer and a graphic designer in uh, Plenum. And I'm Martin uh, and I'm also a service designer and a graphic designer in Plenum. Yeah. Uh, so Plenum is uh, a pretty new uh, company. We are located in uh, uh, Tromsø in the Arctic, um, 
And uh, we have been working on this uh, project. Uh, you can see here our team. We, we work with Heidi and uh, Turoga. In addition, we had to involve, we, we wanted to expand our team to, to work more uh, interdisciplinary. So we uh, included some, uh, some help with, uh, from Lab Nunoge, which uh, helped us with the development, as well as uh, Travash, who helped us with the sort of uh, interacting with inhabitants through digital solutions, uh, as well as uh, Nordic Smart House, which is a, a module house uh, maker or <laughs> a company that sells uh, smart houses, uh, micro houses in uh, Buda, also in the north of Norway. So they helped us with making the uh, illustrations of the physical houses. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about distances because uh, as you can see on this map, uh, Kosic, uh, it takes 48 hours to drive to Tromsø from uh, Kosic, and then it takes uh, 11 hours from Tromsø to Lebesby. So uh, even though we are in the north of Norway and Lebesby in the north, is in the north of Norway, it's still quite a big distance from here to, uh, to Lebesby. Um, and uh, as Hege talked about, it's, uh, it's a big uh, municipality. They have 1,295 people living there. Most of them live in Kjellefjord, the community center, uh, and the rest are spread out throughout the municipality. Um, and as you can see, it takes three hours and 41 minutes to drive from one side to the other. Uh, and that is if the roads are open. So <laughs> they have a really, really big space uh, with people spread out over vast distances. Uh, and they have a lot of challenges uh, in, in, the, in the task that we read through when we started. We could see they had a lot of challenges that uh, s uh, other municipalities uh, share with them, like uh, aging population and uh, how to interact with the inhabitants and, and using uh, digital the digitalization. Um, but we were really inspired by this idea that they could be the first municipality with digital inhabitants. And we thought it was really ambitious. Uh, for them to say everyone, no matter where they are from or where they are, they can be a research to let us be both physically and digitally. So in this, uh, we had to come up with a concept, but we also had to define what is a digital inhabitants. And that was really exciting for us. Um, the way we work in Plano, we are really human focused, so we uh, used the inhabitants in Lebesby uh, quite a lot in coming up with our ideas and testing them out throughout the process, as well as uh, people who used to live there but have moved away. We talked to politicians, we talked to the municipality staff, and uh, we talked to bis local businesses. Um, and based on our research, we came up with some personas, and a persona is a uh, fictional person representing a target group. So from the left, you can see Hannah, she's a student who's left uh, Schellefjord uh, and she misses home. And you have Adelina, she's a, a migrant worker or immigrant to Lebesby who's moving to Lebesby to, to work as a fisherman. Uh, Isaac is a 15 year old student who is about to start secondary school and he has to move away from Lebesby. And uh, Elias, he's a 30-year-old man living in Oslo who's interested in what Norway has to offer, interested in experiencing new things. Uh, and Siv is an uh, is, uh, employer looking for people. And out of these people, we decided that Isaac is the most important person because he represents someone who is living in Lebesby. He's representing someone who has left Lebesby and he might represent someone who will uh, come back to, or move to Lebesby at one point in later in time. So the concept is uh, two parts, really. It's about getting these different target groups uh, onto a digital platform where they can communicate and collaborate. And through this digital platform, they get access to the modular houses or the modular village. Uh, which is uh, modular houses that are placed around the whole of municip the whole municipality, and this together can create this fun and innovating arena for everybody, no matter where you are. So, and with the different users, we also saw that they maybe uh, will be using this platform in different stages. Like Adelina will be, uh, she would need to use it before she arrives in Melbourne, but uh, he's stuck using it while he's living there and Hannah 
is using it after she moved. So they will have some different uses that are relevant. So Adelina maybe could get a, a welcome message from the mayor and uh, some information about uh, Lebesby, like how to, do you want a guide in Lebesby or do you, do you need, do you want to know how to become part of the society or uh, what you, what you need to know uh, to live in Lebesby, that kind of information. Or for instance, Hannah, who is a student, uh, for her work and education might be the most relevant for her. Or Isaac, who lives there now, it's about the dialogue and the communication with the other uh, people who are living there, the local uh, citizens, and creating events and, uh, and activities for, for the people who live there. And so we started sketching out kind of like a, a how this could look like if if this was a website, like you would start with uh, recruitment to get people to use this uh, as fast as possible. And, and this is, can be worked on in stages and you have to show everybody and tell them what, what are the modular houses and how can you use them. And you have like this event board, like what's going on right now? What are people doing? Can, what, can, what can you join and participate in like Facebook really? And some areas maybe are more of a focus area than others, like education, because education is a really big part uh, of uh, the, one of the challenges Lebesby has, because it's one of the uh, biggest reasons that uh, young people move is because they have to take up the education another place. So what if you could use this platform, this digital platform and these modular houses to gather the students and give them an opportunity to study from home? Uh, and you could have like, uh, courses where you invite uh, uh, professionals from different areas uh, to have courses for the inhabitants. Yeah, so we started making some scenarios on how this uh, digital platform could uh, could work. So in this case, uh, Isaac, he has visited the modular village, the physical houses, and he is inspired to create an event for him and his friends. So the digital platform through it, you can, uh, you can organize an event uh, and you get access to the different modular houses. And the platform also uh, asks you to uh, to get in touch with other people on the platform or to the municipality direct. May perhaps he, this event qualifies to get some uh, funding to organize it. And also, uh, when he finished uh, making the event, it will be published uh, on the platform. And uh, other people who are interested in these kinds of events, they can get the notifications. Like, for example, Elias, the 30-year-old in Oslo, he has... Uh, said he's interested in contributing on these kinds of events, he will get a notification. And if he decides to, to go to Levisby to help, he can perhaps get a discount on plane tickets or uh, staying in these modular houses. And it's, so it becomes sort of like a, a give and take uh, relationship. Like we call it the Dugnad in uh, the Dugnad spirit <laughs> in Norwegian. It's, you, you, uh, you're not just paying to experience something, but you're actually contributing to the society. And of course, the event lives on on the platform after as well, so that it can inspire other people to do similar things. We want to encourage all the users to use each other as resources, really, and to yeah to, yeah. to collaborate with each other. Yeah, and uh, also like uh, for see the employer, she can she is looking for someone with local knowledge, uh, and she can have a look through the users of the platform and. And here she can separate between digital or local inhabitants uh, and uh, she can find people based on their skills or their interests. So in this case, she finds Hannah, the student uh, living uh, somewhere else, and she thinks she's a good candidate. So she can contact her and ask her if she's interested in the position or the other way around. If Hannah's coming home for the summer and she needs a job, she can find uh, relevant projects uh, on the platform. So that's the, the digital part, the digital platform. We're just, we are also going to show you some of the sketches we made and the thoughts about the modular houses, the physical part. So we have uh, different modules for different uses. Uh, one of them is the living, where it's you're supposed to uh, live for shorter or longer periods of time. They are environmentally friendly uh, in the in the fact that they don't make a huge impact on the nature where you put them. So you can, in theory, uh, move them or remove them totally if you wanted to and if the need was there. Um, and 
yeah, these the the content in these houses can be customized based on uh, what you need. So one could be a cafe, or one could be like a house for two people, or or maybe more, and they can be put together to make even larger houses. And we were playing about with the idea of creating a modular village uh, where you had all these living modules around one bigger multifunctional house uh, that's. Uh, that everybody can use together, uh, all, both the people who are living in the modular houses, but also other inhabitants. And so it's kind of like a shared community center where you uh, have this huge building, fancy building with, uh, the, with big rooms so that you can, you can customize kind of the use of them for whatever you need. So it could be like a you could have a, a dance course here or a co-working um, office, or uh, you can have a wedding uh, whatever would be needed. And this house could be kind of like a, a symbol for uh, for Lebesby, uh, for uh, uh, innovation and uh, in collaboration and uh, co-creating. Like this would be like this symbol for that Lebesby is ahead and, and uh, they want to invite people to use their facilities. And this house is also based on modules. So in theory it can also be uh, built pretty simple and uh, you can expand it if you want to it's scalable it's kind of like fancy lego <laughs> yeah and the whole concept is is scalable in that way that you can you can start small with a few houses uh, you can even use the existing houses just to try out the concept to see if it's working and then you can add more uh, houses uh, as you see the needs and we also thought about, because we thought this could be like a village connected to Kjellefjord where most of the people are living, but we also wanted to do something for the whole municipality. So we also thought about the last uh, modules, were, which are mobile modules. And these, these would be like satellites in the community. They are sort of self-sustained with solar panels and they have water tanks and so that you can be completely off the grid and they should be easy to move so you can have uh, houses where you need them. Uh, or or labs or whatever. So here's just a sketch where you see the big uh, village in the in Schellefjord and then smaller modules placed around uh, like a laboratory uh, or something or even one on the ocean, who knows. Um, and this is also, you know, you can add them over time and uh, you can move them around. So if you have sort of a, a special event like Kikune Stagan, you can move the houses and you can provide houses for the, the people uh, during that festival. Yeah, so that's in summary our suggestion. It's the digital platform combined with the modular houses that together will create a fun environment for and where you can meet both digitally and physically. Uh, but we think you need both to, to get everything. <laughs> uh, so hopefully this together will make like a lively and active society in Lebesby. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Um, we already have one direct question, uh, but maybe I will ask Marco to show the QR code uh, again so that we can see and continue with the Q&A uh, directly. So first one is already to you, and it's a direct question of how you deal with waste management in modular houses. How do you deal with sewer systems? So this is a technical uh, to a plenum. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, we will uh, see the Slido so that you can uh, add some questions later. So Martin and uh, Ivind, can you answer? Yeah, for the village and the, and the main houses, uh, it will have to be built like uh, like you would normally with the house like all these details haven't been worked out yet because we're now in the stage where we're figuring out like what's what would be the first uh, the first priorities to uh, develop but for the so but it would have to be a normal sewage system uh, yeah that's also why we were, we know. why we, we wanted to do it connected to Shellfield because you have all this uh, system in place mm. you won't have to do that much uh, changes mm -hmm. but mm. Uh, at least the mobile modules, they would have the, the sewage uh, built into the houses so you can empty them yeah. in uh, certain places. So there would have to be someone who uh, takes care of them, but uh, they can go for a long period of time without, uh, without anybody doing anything. Mm. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe now we'll see the, the other questions who, uh, which came. So in total, how many houses do you plan to build in the first phase? We don't know that yet. <laughs> that's kind. That's what we're trying to work out now. But hopefully, uh, a few uh, just to start off. But uh, as we said, there is a possibility where you can kind of use this concept on existing buildings as well, just to test and figure out like a prototype, really, to figure out what like what kind of needs uh, do we like what we have to figure out what we don't know yet uh, okay. so but most likely there will be just a few in the start uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then it and, and then it can expand afterwards maybe but the whole, whole mm -hmm. reason why we looked at modules is because we don't want to make a big impact and, and create something before we know that uh, it's being used so that's why we want to start small and and scale over time but uh, yeah, this was for the competition and we can dream big and uh, of course now we are in reality. So now we are doing a project to try to figure out uh, what's the next step basically mm. because this, this will take some time to, to build. Thank you. And there is one uh, question, uh, maybe also then uh, Hege can uh, follow with uh, her opinion. Have you thought about attracting digital nomads to Lebesby? Yeah, I think we actually, the first, because this, this competition had two stages and this first stage, it was open uh, and then there was like a final round. And in the first stage, we were really focused on the digital nomad or like people like ourselves, basically, like, why would we want to go there? And it was a very like outside and in perspective. And then in the second phase, we talked to the inhabitants and we realized we needed to create something that is for them as well. Uh, so, so yeah. Of course, we we have thought about the digital nomads and and uh, people who are interested in trying living uh, and uh, and uh, mm. you know tourists and yeah we have a lot of different groups that we think can use this but mm. uh, and we have we have a big focus on the whole part of uh, inviting the world to Lebesby and that uh, this platform can help you get in touch with people there and the modular houses would be a, a really cool place to visit. Like it would be, uh, if it looks looks really cool, you would kind of like, either if you want to go there on vacation or you want to go there for a few months or weeks or days to work and be in a remote, more remote place maybe, if, uh, if you maybe live in a, like a huge city. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much for your presentation. Um, maybe one more question from me uh, to Hege. Uh, you were mentioning a lot uh, digital generations or digital natives and all your personas were pretty much uh, connected to digital technologies already. But from Sp Slovak perspective, uh, we have a challenge, uh, which is the digital divide that lo older people usually don't use uh, so much technology. Um, what is the situation in Lebesby? Um, I also saw that the, the population is aging. Uh, so uh, is uh, this also provided or do you think in the service uh, about maybe offline version for those who don't use technology? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, and we see this sort of uh, wave of uh, or this aging population is most prominent in the villages. Um, but in this project, we've chosen to focus on younger people first. Um, partly because younger people tend to um, participate less in the sort of traditional um, involvement processes like public meetings, but also that young people tend to uh, uh, shy away from social media when social media gets taken over by slightly older people. Uh, so from the outset, we wanted to have a focus on young people. But I have to say too that um, there is so much going on when it comes to technology and different generations. And one of the things that Lebesby has um, uh, focused on over the last few years is to um, build out what we call welfare technology, which could include 
Um, so, for instance, if if you're uh, say an 80 year old woman living in coon nests, now previously you'd have to have a nurse driving all the way in to Kunes and or to Venus and spend more than one work day to, say, measure her blood pressure. But with this welfare technology, the, the patient or the user, her or himself, can measure this blood pressure um, and the result goes into an iPad and then the result gets sent to... Um, the uh, the health center here in Chardefjord and there are nurses here that check these results and then call up the users if there's um, well if anything uh, needs to be done or if there's anything out of the ordinary so I think um, I, I do see the sort of um, digital divide but I, I do also think that there are ways of down the track, uh, creating some solutions that will be uh, usable for for the older generations as well. And I also think there are plenty of ways we could um, uh, sort of direct this, like having maybe digital rooms in each village where you can go and get help to use the... Uh, the iPad or the computer, or if you need to get in touch with someone here at the the, the town hall here in Kjellefjord. So I think um, it's not something we've thought about um, sort of in detail yet, but um, I think there are ways of of working around that um, that challenge. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you for uh, all four of you for this exciting presentation. Uh, it's very inspiring and I'm really uh, excited to continue our conversation. So now we will go to the Slovak part and I will give uh, words to Victoria for all of you who want to pose questions also to uh, other speakers, you're welcome to do so during the whole time. So uh, we uh, also can come back to the Norwegian concept. Uh, Victoria is an architect and planner and designer, and she will uh, present the case of Spolka, which is a transdisciplinary collaboration uh, collective. And um, now uh, she's, she studied um, architecture at, uh, in Prague and also in Japan, so uh, it will be also an in interesting uh, comparison. Uh, Victoria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for introducing uh, Zuzana uh, and thank you very much for inviting Spolka uh, to this event. Um, I'm going to present uh, you uh, just a brief overview basically of few methods that we use as a collective in a Slovak environment uh, in participatory practices. And uh, I'm going to focus on uh, various uh, well, more, not, not really digital things, but uh, rather um, um, methods that we, that we use in a, in, a, in a more physical way. But I see a potential of transforming them into digital world as well. Yes, Uspoka is a collective of uh, architects and sociologists and other disciplines and uh, is, a, is a group of people that kind of uh, works transdisciplinary uh, um, and our focus is uh, to challenge the way the space, space is produced. So we do that through uh, various participatory methods or through education. We create our own formats of transdisciplinary education, summer school, uh, various collective discussions and collaborative projects in, uh, um, in the step in education and also in, um, in actual planning and and design. Um, first, I'm going to show you a short uh, case study of Medjani Hammer, um, which is a participatory project that we did uh, last year with uh, civic society Za Medjani Hammer. Um, Medjani Hammer is an industrial heritage site, uh, a very important one in Banska Bistrica. And we were asked to create a sort of a public opinion on this uh, site or to map it through various methods. Um, and before the um, 
because the site was for a very long time quite abandoned, uh, partially or partially used for other purposes, like uh, even though um, its its atmosphere was kind of like diminished, and we tried uh, through uh, these methods, uh, various methods such as questionnaire or interviews or a visioning workshop, a specific method that we created to to uh, kind of imagine ways how can be this uh, place used in future by the city council. Um, by the city council. Um, for example, in the questionnaire that we created, uh, we focused a lot on the various atmospheres and stories that Medjani Hamor affords. Uh, we were asking people about how, how do they imagine the space to look like, to feel like, and what stories uh, are behind it. So we were trying to, uh, instead of just uh, saying what they like and what they do not like or what they want to do, imagine a certain kind of feeling that uh, would, uh, would then bring, would then be a better description for, for architects as well in the future when they will redesign it. Um, with the basis of this questionnaire, we then uh, created a specific uh, visioning workshop which is a kind of like a game, uh, a strategic planning game uh, for uh, local stakeholders, important stakeholders from various sectors, uh, private sector, public uh, sectors, academia, or important, uh, important individuals uh, that have voice in the city, strong voice. And we collected them around the around table and each of, um, each of the group created a certain scenario of how this, um, how this site can look like in the future. So uh, all of these things that we see are based on, uh, on the questionnaire that we created, uh, such as uh, various functions or activities that people can do there. And we, uh, we, we were discussing it, we were discussing uh, with the stakeholders about the placement of the function because each, because each of these buildings that is in the site is a very specific uh, spatial characteristics as well as uh, we were talking about uh, different target groups or, or groups of people or other others than humans as well, um, plants or, or uh, animals that can take uh, part in this part of the site so they, they can kind of be involved in that. Um, the third part that we were discussing with the stakeholders was who is going to take care of the site and the various functions because um, because it's a quite a complex area with a various uh, also uh, ownerships or like very, uh, there is a ownership model is quite uh, quite uh, complex. Uh, we we wanted to discuss also that because uh, we see uh, care like also after future uh, after uh, after care as an important part of the process and for sustainability of the project. Um, each of this. Each of these uh, games or st uh, scenarios was set in a very specific time and uh, uh, the participants were also uh, encouraged to write a little story around it. So what happens there, what is the atmosphere again, you know, to, to, to gain kind of like a, again, a feeling about how, how do they imagine the space work like and look like, uh, what materials and so on can be used. And um, so, yeah, <laughs> and uh, I think the important uh, learning from this is that uh, we're using different kind of uh, games uh, for talking with people can, can like uh, cross, uh, can help us cross the barriers when we, which we have when we talk or when, where we draw. So combining various uh, ways of uh, expression can very much help in participation. Um, the second uh, case study I'm going to show you is uh, um, our method of collective mapping. Um, it's, it's a method that we develop through time and uh, it's always changing. It's not a static thing. We are, we are uh, still on our way to find out how this workshop works. And mostly we use it as an as a educational workshop, not as a part of participatory practices. But we already started to use it as part of participation as well for one certain case, and hopefully we will get more opportunities now. 
uh, collective mapping is uh, based on uh, personal imagination or like personal experience of the space. So each of the participants uh, explores the space by themselves. So in, in the workshop, uh, we create a time, time frame for everyone to, to go around, to, um, to get, um, so they get bored in the space, they, they, and they write everything important down in the, so, such a map that kind of encompasses, encompasses their whole experience of the space. Uh, this is where we start. This image is uh, for us uh, like a base for discussion in pairs and then in groups about what are the important things, aspects, um, I don't know, personas, whatever, they find important uh, in, in the space and they want to maintain them like in this map because this map uh, presents uh, such a also again like a baseline for a future discussion. So uh, nothing is uh, nothing that would be hidden in a normal map, in a, in a traditional mapping, um, can, it can be brought uh, into the discussion as well. So, um, uh, after this uh, collective discussion, the aim is to create a, a collective map of the space, which represents the needs of the group or the, or the experiences of the group. And it also needs to have a legend and a name, and, and it's very much situated in, the, in that particular moment. And um, I, I see that as, as an important uh, part of participatory process to get this understanding of your of your personal needs as well as the needs of others, because it it kind of creates a kind of like a base where mutual things can happen in the same time. So I think through this workshop, what we try to do is first to build a care, uh, careful uh, relationship with the site like to kind of become part of it as, as uh, written by Jacobs, but also um, also to see that maybe our stories that we have are, and the, our experiences in the space can somehow happen mutually and they are maybe not so different to each other. So this is a learning that uh, we want to people uh, want people to have. And uh, from that point, uh, so this can be seen as a pre-step, from that point we can move on maybe to a discussion about future. Uh, we also uh, tried to do this uh, uh, online recently because of the pandemic, uh, although uh, all of the people were in different spaces. So what we, what we were discussing was mostly about what, what do they find important in space and how their uh, expectations of certain spaces is similar or dissimilar, or what other actors that are in the space can also find important. For example, uh, after the personal experience of some space, uh, we were discussing uh, the other, for example, pigeons that uh, are in the space as well, and what would they need, what would they need to change in the space that we experience in order to be it good for the pigeons, for cars, and for the, for the planet as well. So uh, through that, we kind of uh, try to sensitize uh, and also visualize uh, the needs of non-human uh, world as well, even though it's more like an empathic, uh, empath empathetic exercise. Um, last but not least about mapping, uh, I think it's important to tell that how we see mapping is not uh, just uh, something that reproduces the present, but it's already a, a future in the making. It's uh, already a process of visualizing things that maybe in other other ways of mapping would be uh, would be forgotten it's visualizing the needs of uh, some actors maybe that wouldn't be visible uh, and uh, therefore it already produces some kind of uh, future that can be then um, discussed in more detail so they kind of gain the agency uh, and then then can be part of the discussion uh, so, um, as I said, like uh, maybe, especially this mapping, as I showed you, is not um, a complete participatory process. Is a part of it, and uh, I see uh, as our main question in this in this um, specific method is who are the stakeholders. So through through our personal experience, we try to find out who else is uh, affected by our our uh, our 
thoughts, our projects, our changes that we are trying to do. So what we see as stakeholders are not only people who actually take part, but also those who are affected, such as um, which various uh, natural elements, uh, weather, or uh, I don't know, uh, river, plants, animals, or whatever really is affected by our design, uh, uh, design thoughts or uh, design projects. Uh, what we try also to focus on and why we also do these uh, workshops in a manner that we use drawing and and uh, talking together is to create a certain uh, uh, it's to create a sense of inclusivity where everyone can use the method that they feel most comfortable with or they or combine them in a certain way and also to overcome uh, the 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 feeling of the not so round table so like uh, that we feel uh even though we have the same kind of place in discussion maybe uh we we need to somehow correct it so so everybody gets place to discuss um i think just to mention as a as learning in the end uh i would like to say that what how we see and understand uh, space making and city making is a very much an everyday practice we see it as something that is by done by every citizen every day and citizens meaning in the broadest sense as the, again uh, the citizens with nature and the and the beautiful birds of Košice, who were, which are very common here and uh, so they kind of co-create a city but on everyday basis and through that we kind of encourage people to understand this this agenda or like understand this power they have to change the, their world around them and uh, but we always try not to forget about um, our specific position, each of the participants or us, uh, when we form new realities or design new stories uh, or utopias, uh, because we work a lot with imagination, that uh, each of them is very much affected by uh, our own position, our own, own uh, needs, our own situation, moods and so on, and we always try to take them into uh, consideration, which we did uh, in Medjani Hangar and as well as uh, what we do in mapping workshops. And uh, for the future, what we are trying to do now, uh, and what is our challenge, I would say, is uh, that we are trying to develop these um, tools or move these tools uh, we created in more like artistic manner and sense into more uh, into professional themes or uh, to work more with public. What we are uh, planning uh, to do in the, this year with one small uh, city of Košice, uh, where we are creating a, a, strategic, a strategic plan for adaptation for uh, climate uh, change and uh, embedded in the urban plan. So I see there uh, this big challenge of how this professional team can collaborate. And also, I think for us, uh, what we try to do in a more um, long-term way is to to make a sense uh, to pro promote this sensitive and a positional approach in architecture and planning in general. And last but not but, but not least, um, I see mm -hmm. imagination and visioning tools as a way to overcome the the somehow uh, the locked status quo that we are in, and we need to so we see that we need to allow ourselves to, to imagine things again in a way to overcome these complex problems that, that, we, that we face. And that will be all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. And um, we will go directly to Misha Hudak. Um, and for those, in the meantime, uh, when Misha is loading his presentation, I'll just say the hashtag 336752. Uh, and I'm inviting Misha, who is active citizen and founder of uh, Východné Pobrežie, studied a uh, uh, documentary film, architecture and new media, and is also um, living and uh, working in Košice and mostly enjoys bringing up his daughter. So uh, this is to Misha, uh, who can present his project and his work. Hello to you all. Uh, hope that you hear me well. Because uh, please uh, speak directly to your mic microphone because we can't hear you well. Yeah. I you. I can speak directly to my microphone. Thank it's okay you. right now. Yes. Yeah. Cool. 
I'm really glad that I can be part of this workshop, especially about placemaking. I will try to cut it as short as possible because Vicky mentioned a lot of lot of lot of tools that we are uh, using also. My name is Michel Hudak, and I'm founder and still something like runner of organization which is called Východne Pobreže, which is literally means East Coast. In the end of the presentation, you will you will probably understand why. Uh, we have variety of of works that we uh, already did, but uh, we are mainly focusing on empowering, fostering, creating, finding innovative way how to how to make public life, public spaces, and active citizenship more present in city of Kosice and, and in the region of Kosice, which means more or less the eastern part of Slovakia. Maybe you are familiar, maybe not. Eastern Slovakia is one of the poorest regions of the European Union. So we are dealing with many, many different aspects of work that uh, we could deal if we are somewhere in Berlin or somewhere else. I don't want to complain, I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm going to show you really briefly, let's say, a couple of examples of our participatory, participatory uh, tools that we used in the city of Kusce and in a city around us uh, since 2000, let's say, eight. This week, in, uh, in, during the weekend, we will celebrate 13 years of official entity, uh, but we are more or less around in about 15 years, I suppose, since 2007. So we started really early with British Council. Uh, British Council used to have uh, in whole Europe large uh, concept which were called Futuristy Games. And it was concept of uh, participatory planning of small mid-scale issues in, in the European cities. We, uh, we did 10 of such games where the game was the, the principle was easy, like to get together uh, people who are involved in some kind of problem. The picture is from one of the game where the community centers in 2008 and 2009 uh, start to emerge in the city of Kosice and they struggle with the uh, programming of their content. So we prepare for them planning game how to engage as much as possible communities, active citizens and so on to share the common spaces. And it was really tough because on the one, one side you have uh, um, elder, uh, elder, elder people who wants to just talk and uh, um, I don't know, read books. There was like young dancers. There were also like pensioners who used to be the pilots of the of the battle uh, uh, planes and so on. So it was it was really tough to to put it together, such a such a different communities on a, on a one table. But we succeed after two days of this planning game. We set up the program, and we set up the stair, uh, the, the prototype of such places because there is seven uh, different kind of community places in Kosice like that. And more or less in the last 10 years, they are coping on, on the same prototype that we built for them. Uh, in 2011, we were, for the first time, we were asked uh, by developer who wants to build some kind of supermarket, grocery shop, whatsoever, large, big uh, like development in one of the most dense place in Slovakia, where really 25,000 people lives in a, in a place which is smaller than 1.5 kilometer, square kilometer. And we made an in-person survey. In one week, we, we spoke with, with uh, 1,700, 1,700 households. And we put on the table uh, results from this survey and the developer decided not to build uh, his development here because he was afraid that he's going to lose money because people uh, not hate him, but somehow want to avoid his project. Uh, since 2010, I suppose, till 2016, we made a, a large project which was called Culture Fighter. It was a mapping of 
creative and cultural industries all around the Europe. It was creating some kind of knowledge base online tool for those who are interested in, in such tools like recreating the cities, financing the culture, creating large cultural events and so on. And I put, uh, I pick up the, the, the picture from Tallinn, from Lina Labor Organization, which are directly working with participatory planning uh, all around uh, Estonia. So uh, this is where we uh, find out and, and learn again new and new tools. Uh, this is the project that we made uh, all around our city. Uh, we somehow ranked public spaces, especially uh, children's playgrounds, uh, on different areas of the city. And this, 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 uh, let's say terrain, terrain uh, field research leads directly to direct uh, cooperation with uh, one uh, local municipality, where we uh, were able to. Uh, reconstruct and, and, and with citizens we were able to design reconstruction revitalization of three different playgrounds and a lot of small public spaces. In total it was like investment around 120,000 euros. So we can we can we, we were we were able to really not just plan it but also to, to control all the process. What was great and I can mention it we, we, we did a lot of uh, participatory planning meetings but the best tool was, uh, Vicky mentioned it in a previous uh, presentation, to recognize who is the real stakeholder. Because in uh, children's playgrounds, the stakeholders are not the parents. It's, it, in fact, it's children's. So we, we create, it, it, it was weird, it, it, it was fun. We, we created a small tour with children's around six, nine, ten years. And they were like, I remember there was like a young guy, Adam, and he was like, oh, in this playground, I can do nothing because it's not for me. And in this playground, I can do nothing because it's not for me. Oh, in this playground, my little sister can go and play, but it's not for me. So this was the, this was the, really, the, the real stakeholder who is really the, the, the daily user of it. So we, we understand the demographics of, of the place are changing. The, the public spaces are uh, and playgrounds are designed for the really tiny kids up to three, six years. So we we start to see that we cannot use only the the, the usual tools, and we have to uh, uh, somehow develop and evolve the tools in situ for 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 such a case. Uh, now I'm 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 going really really quickly to to uh, this this. Uh, let's say, era. Uh, 2020, we were asked by the third biggest city in Slovakia, Presho, to create for them a cultural strategy for the development of their, of their culture in the city, uh, also independent culture organizations and so on. So for almost one year, we created analyzes, all the document, all the action plan for up to three years, I suppose. And we discuss with more than 50 different organizations in the city, not only from the culture, but also uh, from, from the fields of inclusion, from the fields of environment. So, so we, 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 for the first time, we brought this large holistic concept, like culture is not only the cultural fields as is written in definition. So it was... It was during the pandemic, so it, it wasn't it wasn't easy. It was it was, it was hybrid. It was mixed, but in person, small groups, big groups. It was this design thinking, uh, brainstorming, whatsoever. It was really mixed. It was really we again we have to have to um, develop it for the purpose, for the case, for the scale of the city. And when we when we create it, we had another round how to push it through the city municipality offices, which was by far really, really tough, tough job to, to work with uh, local officers. What we have on the table right now, maybe you are familiar, maybe not, uh, the city of Košice uh, got a large consortium of nine organizations. Three of them are city-owned uh, or city-run. Uh, there are some academia, some uh, private companies. There are two companies from Bratislava, capital city. And there is one NGO in this uh, consortium, which is our NGO, 
and the project is um, mainly to foster the trust of citizens into the municipality bodies and there are like another goals uh, how to how to uh, get people more involved into planning of the city and what we have on our shoulders is mainly uh, field research of non places of places who lost their functions and, and they are somehow out of sight and so on and what is the topic uh, what we really like and we, where I want to go it's storytelling uh, since beginning since beginning 2007 eight nine we start to recreate like story of Kosice, which is let's say quarter million big city with large steel uh, factory and uh, it was heavy industrial city and it turns into some kind of transformation <laughs> basic information of Kosice. But I think it's not enough for local people. So we start to looking for, searching for, and creating manufacturing new stories, which are based on truth, which are based on local knowledge, and, and uh, are, are based on local emotion. We start to create new stories. We, we publish a lot of books, which are subjective uh, um, stories of our city. Uh, how to how to see the city uh, in 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 uh, in real, to see the weaknesses and strengths and so on. And by this by these books and by this narration by these stories, we gain a lot of attention because we start to focusing and start to pointing on the problems that were usually out of sight or, or people don't see them as a problem. Uh, on the very first presentation, there was like. Uh, also, I, 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 I'm surprised. And also, you uh, in Norway, you can you can challenge the same stuff. A lot of people are moving outside of the city, outside of the country, and we are losing uh, like like quality of the people. Uh, the aging is again, it's really really strong problem. But some of the topics were not the were not the topics not even in top ten. Uh, what was the main cases in the city? But but different narration and be using a lot of lot of sarcasm, lot of humor, lot of lot of inside jokes, which are mainly be understandable by the local citizens. We are able to navigate a bit discussion into into those into those uh, uh, topics. Now, what we are doing right now, and, and I, this is my personal topic, I want to. Uh, uh, put the, the, the focus on, on the fact that in Kosice we have new minorities, especially Ukrainians and Vietnamese uh, individual people who are from many perspectives who are invisible for the for the for the city, for all the citizens. This is what we are working with. Like it is not a popular topic, it's a hard topic, it's a heavy topic, but again we are turning narration towards this. 2014, I was in Detroit. Maybe you're familiar. It's like first post city, which lost everything, and now it's 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 built from the ashes. I, I had this opportunity for a couple of weeks to get there, get around, and to see a lot of uh, organization, uh, institutions, uh, individual people who are dealing with the same what we are doing, like how to retell. The story of such a city, which used to be one of the best cities in the US, and right now is not. I, I saw the Heidelberg project before it was burned out. I spoke with the people in Opportunity Detroit. It, it was it was quite amazing, quite inspiring stuff. And coincidentally, in 2010, the Detroit established the first city storyteller as as official as official uh, job in the city uh, mr thomas he, he's he's a really kind guy who who, who go around the, around the city and, and 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 putting together stories of elder detroiters youngsters those who who spend there the whole time and also those who just move there it's like there is no narration like oh you, you have to born here or you have to i don't know what and this is why we are working with this emotional citizenship, which is quite different with digital uh, citizenship, because there are so many people who uh, are connected with Kosice and they're not 
live in Kostce anymore, or maybe they are not living in Kostce yet. So this is what we are building. We are building uh, some kind of like uh, metaphor, some kind of a dream, some kind of, of something which doesn't have to be tangible. I hope that it was just for one person, uh, you can understand what I want to tell because this is what I usually do that people don't know what I was speaking about. We are creating an uh, entity which is not based on physical spaces, but is it, it, it's uh, based on hope uh, and on dream that the, the Kosice, its streets, its, its places could be the better place for living. This is, this is basically what I want to, to say. We established the East Coast our organization by sitting on the east coast of Spain, which is Barcelona. We are picking up the, the inspiration mainly from East Coast cities like New York, Tokyo, Rio de Janeiro, whatsoever, whatsoever. We are dealing with this dream, like we want to have these qualities here. Uh, Again, uh, I'm not quite sure if Oslo is on the on the east coast of Norway, but city of Kostce, as we are in collaboration with many municipalities, local, regional one, national one, uh, we get together with city of Kostce uh, to Oslo in 2019 to establish some discussions. Uh, city of Kostce, not directly our organization, but city of Kostce are in cooperation mainly in environmental issues uh, with uh, Norwegian uh, municipalities. So we, we, we see Norway uh, in many ways as a place for inspiration. So I hope we can, we can, we can carry on this for the whole project and, and we can discuss more about that. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't that like punctual and factual. Uh, we are working with emotion, with nostalgia. So uh, I'm glad that I can put this uh, all time on the table. Uh, thank you so much for attention. I hope I didn't uh, prolong it that much. I will be available for the rest of the evening and you can you can contact us anytime. I'm, I'm glad to be part of this. Take care, be healthy. Thank, thank you. you so much for the Thank you, Michel. And now we will go directly to Pavel Miroshay um, in order to uh, speed up a little bit uh, with the last speaker and then we can have a discussion. Uh, even though we are already past time that we proposed, I'm very sorry for that. But there is so much to share, so I am happy that we can all be here for a couple of more minutes, hopefully. Um, so now uh, it's Pavel Miroshay, who is the CEO of Slovensko IT. Uh, the company that is developing software in solutions for Slovakia and who is also a very big patriot in Eastern Slovakia and was behind the very successful coordination of Košice IT Valley. Uh, Pavel, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks also to other speakers that was very inspiring to, to hear. I will be talking a little bit more about IT. Uh, Michel, just before me, mentioned several things about Košice and uh, I'm trying to maybe uh, tell you more about how citizens can help the government to provide better, uh, better services and better maybe IT services. I'm coming from a company called Slovensko IT or Slovakia IT, uh, which is the state-owned uh, IT software house. But uh, as, as, as Mission mentioned just before, uh, Košice are hidden treasure of Central Europe and uh, uh, we are very proud uh, of our city, it's very nice, but uh, there is also, uh, as we call it, as, uh, Košice as a hidden IT treasure of Central Europe because uh, in in 60s, uh, in 1960s, uh, there was a big steel factory built in Košice and for the next 50 years it was more about the uh, steel factory and the uh, steel industry and a lot of people work uh, in, uh, in that industry. But uh, in 2007, around 2007 it changed and the city started to focus more uh, on, uh, on IT services and then on IT in general. 
And uh, right now we have more than, we started with less than 1,000 IT specialists, and uh, right now we have more than 15,000 IT specialists working in Koshitsa. And that's why uh, we were founded. We are a pretty young company, state-owned. We were founded in 2020. We have 100 employees and we are working on the strategic e-government services or projects uh, that are currently dealing with uh, Slovakia and uh, what we are trying to do because we consider ourselves as a startup and uh, for people who knows and use the e-government systems in Slovakia, they know that they are a little bit of outdated and the, the focus was not uh, very much on, on, uh, on citizens. So we are trying to change it uh, somehow. And we are trying, firstly, we are trying to build up the, the expert base uh, here in, in Košice for, for our state, for Slovakia, uh, and build up the IT center of excellence um, for the government uh, in project management, UX, UI, which is very important uh, uh, regarding listening to the needs of the, of the users, IT architectures and, and testing. So, so we are trying to uh, make a respected group of uh, experts and, uh, and work with them. I will start with a little bit of uh, maybe information uh, or the question we ask a lot of people in Slovakia, so we started with some kind of UX uh, or uh, user research uh, to ask people if they want to deal with something uh, quickly, which is official matter, which method uh, to, to address the, the officials they would choose. And uh, unfortunately, only 15% of all, all people choose that they will use online services. So this is challenge for us. And uh, I'm trying to explain how it actually worked uh, before in, uh, in, in our IT projects in Slovakia and how we are changing it, or at least how we are trying to change it. Uh, so, so basically, uh, at the beginning, there was like huge planning, then, uh, then we have a lot, lot list of projects, then the project managers start to, to deal with all the methodologies, then it was... Uh, given to the suppliers, then we finally, after almost four, maybe six years, it was a product and at the end of the whole process was the citizen. And uh, citizen was, the, the, the key thing is that the citizen was only consum consumer of the, of the products. Uh, and we thought, and we, if you look on the timelines at the bottom of the screen, you can see that uh, when you start pla planning and when you have the, the um, the actual product at the end it's four maybe six years yeah so so it's in, in terms of it it's like a history you know because the, also the, the the technology can be changed in in that period so we thought to ourselves okay we need to change it somehow so what we are trying to do we are trying to focus uh, and change it from project management to product management which is like a standard in it but still in the government and especially in uh, also in the municipalities uh, i can feel that, that it is an issue uh, how to deal with with products especially it products yes yeah? so, so we changed the, the mindset from the project management to the product management and um, we start with the citizen, with the user. Uh, then after that, we, we, are, we are doing the research, etc. cetera, as, as a lot of things, as you mentioned. Uh, um, and then we do the planning, the portfolio, and then we, uh, we are trying to work on the, on the products itself and make uh, some, some kind of lab of it and, and then deliver the product and, and uh, which can be used by the citizen. So, the, the main change is that we uh, we put the citizen not only in the in the end as a consumer uh, of all, but also uh, at the beginning, because we want to hear the, the needs and the requirements which uh, which uh, our users, our citizens have, and the, what we uh, how how we work since we are state owned. Uh, so in terms of maybe in terms of business. Uh, our government should be our uh, customer, but uh, we considered uh, that citizen itself, we as uh, citizens, 
are uh, our customers uh, and the government is only our submitter, as I said, or, or the, the organization which is paying. But our main focus is not on what actually the government uh, representative needs, but actually we are trying to really push and focus all the projects and all the products to what uh, what exactly uh, the citizen needs. And I, I have here a short example of how we work with that, because right now we are working on the... In Slovakia, we have a main um, e-government portal, which deals all, all, all with all the things with, you know, with the, the, regarding the official matters. And uh, we are right now working on the project, which will bring a new version of this portal so so new services for 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 citizens and how we deal with that is that um, uh, is that we really do some kind of comparison we we look on the all different states in europe how they deal with the with their e-government sites uh, we look uh, deeply uh, what kind of applications do they use, how, how actually the, the citizens react, how they use it. Uh, then we do also the user research. Uh, right now we are doing uh, also the user research with the with, with, uh, general public. So we are asking what types of uh, actually needs and requirements those people have. And uh, after that, we have the input. So we are uh some kind of uh, doing the design thinking uh, different design thinking methods we set up the ux department in our company uh, which really focus on to to deliver exact uh, exact uh, product for for people which uh, which will be used uh, and which will be good for them uh, so, so this is. I, I must say, uh, I know that in IT it's a business standard, but in government it was not. So, so we change it, uh, and right now we are working on um, on it, and we are start uh, we are starting to to do uh, do the things differently and provide different types of solutions. Also, what we did because uh, the the situation in Slovakia was a little bit uh, confuser for for citizens and for for uh, people uh, <clears throat> and at the beginning of the year 2021 we have uh, we called uh, we have special rules uh, which were focused on or which were different on different regions and everybody was confused because was the, the, the was only on the papers and uh, uh, and, and, and different official documents and uh, our employees uh, uh, did some research and realized that, okay, nobody understands that, but it's really important to deal with the COVID-19 situation, so we need to do something. We, we need to make uh, some kind of product, uh, so we created the electro uh, electronic version of these uh, rules um, uh, based on the regional, uh, regional um, approach. And... Uh, we uh, were pretty successful with this uh, little project. It was little project started by our, our own employees and purely based on the citizen needs. Yeah, and we were uh, pretty successful with that because we have more than 2.6 uh, unique visitors, which is almost half uh, of the population of Slovakia in percentage. Uh, so, so we consider it as a success also. Uh, a lot of people know and use our application, especially in Slovakia. It's called Green Pass. Uh, when you when you use it as a, with, with your vaccination uh, QR codes, uh, you are providing. So also, we were doing some kind of user research how people will be using this application, and then we we really focus on the the product, which uh, in terms of legal uh, legal requirements will be as much uh, user friendly as possible yeah so so and and also there is there is a success in terms of e-government because a lot of people are using this application and uh, it's it's really good and right now also we are working on the special application which helps uh, which should help uh, the people and citizens to communicate with state and helps states to communicate with uh, with the citizen and it's called Slovakia and mobile 
uh, and this should be kind of really like a application which uh, will have a smart mailbox. So in the future, when when there is some kind of information, for example, uh, some kind of information regarding COVID-19 pandemic or something else, state can directly uh, um, um, message something to, to to citizens or also cities can directly message something to citizens um uh, electronic ids yeah uh, mobile id to to use this application as a as a single sign on uh, <clears throat> application and also for example if you are living in the city you want to pay for example tax uh, for your housing a really simple way how to do it just uh, hey you have a notification that you didn't pay for it let's have a really quick form that you will fill up uh, <clears throat> with just basic information that we don't have as a state because state has a lot of information <clears throat> but uh, but uh, right now they are asking all this information to the, to the citizens and hey yeah you can you can um, you, you can deal with the, the, the tax uh, just uh, sitting on your couch and uh, doing something like that this this is all based on the user research. Um, we are really switching the focus from the needs from the government, uh, maybe office uh, people which are working in the government, and we are really focusing in the, on the regular people using those products. <clears throat> and uh, I think that the most important thing is to to realize, and this is especially the digitalization, is that even a uh, perfect IT product, uh, which is based on the wrong process is a bad, bad IT product. Yeah. So, so when we want to change something, we really need to think about all the, the processes. And uh, so it means for us that process improvement based on the citizen needs is the king for all the success uh, we can have in digitalization and bringing really close um communication with our citizens and with our uh, with the, with the people thank you very much thank you thank you so much um thank you for an interesting connection with it uh we are um, unfortunately out of time uh, but we will have one more thing to do uh, and we would like us uh, to ask uh, marco please share your uh slido because there is uh, a poll that we would like to post to our viewers uh, just to check about the satisfaction. We don't have any running questions yet, so uh, we'll keep the discussion for the, for the unofficial networking part, uh, for the networking part, and um, we will unfortunately skip the public discussion, but we would just like to uh, ask you to answer the poll, um, please uh, indicate your general satisfaction level if you liked uh, the um, event or how you liked the event. So for now we have some answers, but uh, you can maybe uh, join later. Uh, I would just like to thank to all the speakers um, for your interesting inputs. Uh, I would like to thank our partner organization, Urban Space Lab, and also uh, the grants team that supported um, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway through EA and uh, Norway grants um, because of funding the project Slovak Cultural, Slovak Norwegian Cultural Cooperation Matchmaking. Um, thank you very much for all those who were uh, watching us and um, we are looking forward to meeting uh, you in the next discussion that will follow uh, in this project.